Welcome to this week's Fireside Chat with Jesse. I am joined today by Mel Vincent, VP of Marketing and Development for the CLFP Foundation. Thanks for hey. joining me, Mel. Hey, Jesse. Nice to see I you. Wanna, it's great to see you too. And kind of what I mentioned before I hit record, I want to say Reed was probably episode four or six. And this is episode, I think, 207. So. Okay. I'm sure there's been a lot of development over to the CLFP since uh, I had her back on here in uh, 2020. So i um, excited to talk about the foundation, Mel, and looking forward to hearing more about your and uh, your career. Awesome. I'm excited to be here, and it's great to be here on 200 plus episodes with you. You've obviously grown as well with this opportunity, so I'm happy to be here. Perfect. So I'll just uh, jump right in. Mel. And do you mind just kind of introducing yourself and your career to date? That sounds great. Well, for those that don't know me, I'm Mel Vinson. I'm the VP of Marketing and Development at the CLFP Foundation. Short name, long title. Um, for those that don't know what CLFP is, it's the Certified Lease and Finance Professional designation, and we're also a nonprofit organization. So that whole mouthful out of the way. I've been in the industry about 10 years. Um, most of my tenure is at US Bank. So I did okay. some teller work. I was a manager. I was a banker. Loved that. Absolutely love people. I'm very extroverted. Um, for those that have met me, you know that's true. <laughs> and um, <laughs> when I was at the bank, I felt more called towards the business customers because I was a vault teller. I got to do all the deposits and the change orders and I started to seek that outlet. And so the only role that was available in my area at the time was in equipment finance as a collector. And that is a place that most people wouldn't see me going. I'm very outgoing and bubbly and positive, but I was ready to take the challenge on. And so I was a collector in equipment finance. I did a lot of different roles there worked my way into documentation and operations and sales support. Um, I booked loans, I funded loans and leases, and it was awesome. And at the same time as I was doing that, I was also working full-time as a restaurant manager to try to pay off my student loans because we all know that's a, a thing that we got to do. <laughs> and yeah. um, once I had that accomplished, I was feeling good at the bank, but I really wanted to sharpen management and leadership skills. So I took an exit and managed the restaurant full time for a couple of years. And that was awesome because I love food and people and mentoring and all those things combined was a good thing. Um, but I kind of was missing that nine to five situation. So applied back to US Bank, you know, once you're in the equipment finance industry, you can't really leave. So there was me. Sure. <laughs> came back. Um, and when I was there, I just started back. I was with my old team, my old coworkers, and COVID happened. And we know that we were all stuck <laughs> at our houses. We couldn't go anywhere. And um, I was just thinking, you know, should I go back to school? Should I get a new job? What should I do? Should I be a TikTok star? I have no idea. TikTok and... <laughs> star. Did you at least try the TikTok star app? I, I did a lot of memeing in um, COVID. I made some reels. I made a lot of really funny posts. Did not quite get to TikTok, but maybe that is to come. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> I love it every now and then. You throw it out there where it's like, wow, that video got a lot of views and feedback. And then you put another one out like, this one's even better. And like, zero. It's like, so hey, it's like hey, what's going on? Hey. Thank you. Thank you for getting my hopes up. I really appreciate you. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, um, hopefully you will be famous on this podcast and platform. <laughs> oh my gosh. So TikTok didn't work out for me, but when I was kind of in that, what is my next thing? I saw somebody at my work with CLFP after their email signature. So I emailed them back and was like, what is this? I've never seen this before. What is it about? And they said, it's this credential in equipment finance. It's really hard. I don't think you should do it. And I was like, oh, that makes me want to do it more. Who's this more. person? They're the best motivator <laughs> ever. <laughs> so um, through my company, US Bank, I got the handbook. I took a class, passed the test, and it was a very hard but extremely rewarding experience for me that like top 10 moments in my life, 
was this. And I'm not just saying that because I work here <laughs> now, um, but it really changed my life. And so after I took the test, I was like, how do I get involved? How do I continue on this feeling of positivity and how do I help this industry? And so I talked to Reed, our CEO, and she said, well, if you ever want to teach in some of these classes that prepare people for the exam, you could try that. And I said, sign me up. And before you knew it, I was teaching these classes. I was having the time of my life. And in December, there was this post on LinkedIn that said they needed someone to do it full time. And I was like, imposter syndrome. I can't do this. This is for some big uh... smart person. But I'm going to throw my resume in because if I don't, I'll regret it forever. And fast forward to today, this is what I'm doing full time. And it's such a privilege. And I've encountered so many amazing people because of CLFP and my passion for the industry and what we're about. So that's me in a nutshell. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you for sharing. And from an imposter syndrome perspective, you you are you're more than qualified. Okay. Um, oh, you know, we need we need more younger people out there teaching these things. <laughs> Let's just say that to the industry. We don't need older <laughs> consultants or older educators. I mean, we <laughs> all we all have a place in a space and <laughs> I, I've learned so much from people that are more tenured than I, and we can all bring a different thing to the group. So team, team effort. Diversity of knowledge. That's yes. what it comes down yes, to, it right? Is. <laughs> well, awesome. Uh, and you gave a little bit of the background of the, the CLFP, but do you mind just kind of digging in a little bit further? Um, and I might try to go into some numbers that the oh, okay. foundation has increased since you got there. So sure. how, how, how long has the CLFP been around? So next year we're celebrating our 40 years, which is a huge deal. So 1985 was when the CLFP was born and it was actually the certified lease professional designation CLP. Uh, we added the F for finance. You know, we do financing in this industry. And that was in I thought it was fun. Oh, oh yeah. I mean, I'm here for it. Keep it fun. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. I, I, I mean, bad I jokes, love it. Bad jokes. Bad jokes. <laughs> all the bad jokes. We can have them all. <laughs> um, the, the CLFP Foundation entity took place in 2000. And Reed, our fearless leader and CEO, came aboard in 2012. So... The early, you know, 80s, 90s, 2000s, there was about 200-ish members, and Reed really paved the way along with so many others in this industry to build the, the designation and the foundation to what it is today, and I like to say I jumped on a moving train, and I'm still rolling. Like, I am not responsible for the immense growth, but it's I'm helping. I'm helping, you know, and... Um, we had our 1,000th CLFP join the CLFP fam in uh, 2021. It was actually my cohort, someone from my company at the time, U.S. Bank, 1,000th CLFP. So that comma happened in 2021, and this spring we just hit 1,500. So two that's milestones. Fantastic. That's, that's fantastic. So how did you designate within that cohort? Did you draw straws to see oh who my- would be lucky, like like 1,000? I was hoping it would be me so bad because I'd worked so hard, but I was 994, which like, that's a pretty good number. Um, and I'm not bitter. Re- I'm not bitter. I'm only seven. <laughs> you made me six, six older. That's fine too. Come on, let's go. Oh, Frank, here I am. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so we were all in the class and Reed said, you know, whoever finishes the test today will likely be the 1000th person or in line for it. And so we're all testing at the same time. And she graded our test and said, you know, oh, you're this number, you're this number. And we waited and waited. And then the person was announced, um, Jay Christensen from U.S. Bank. So very exciting. Very exciting. <laughs> That's awesome. I, I want to say if I go back to that interview that I was asking if she would do anything special for the 1,000th, but I don't know. We'll have to like Maybe. time jump and then do like a post-1500 reunion podcast Fair. or something. Fair. Fair. So basically it took 16 years to get to a thousand and less than three to get to 1500. Yeah. So Uh when you guys are in your planning meeting, it's like, where do you go from here? (laughs) I feel like one thing that people get really hung up on is the number. And I, of course, I am very enthusiastic and excited when every time we get a CLFP, we all celebrate internally on the staff and in our board. 
But it's not about, you know, are we going to get 300 this year or 400 or 100? It's, you know, how are people being positively impacted by this designation? And, you know, we've had years like back in the 80s and 90s where there was eight people that took the test. And whether it's eight or 100 or a thousand, it's people making a a choice to make a change. And I think that is a celebration. Sure. Sure. And, um, you know, people are yearning, I guess, for that additional education and everything. Mm-hmm. So kudos to you guys for filling that value bucket. Um, and uh, 5,000 over three years, that's, that's phenomenal. Oh, fi- like 500. I wish it was 5,000. Oh, oh 5,000. <laughs> you know, you know, it's math. Okay. Pu- public math. math. It's like something <laughs> nobody can do on the spot. I went to, Oh, I did go to a public school, so shame on me for, for that. But hey, you know, maybe the next time. <laughs> that's the, that's your target goal, I guess. <laughs> 5,000, that'd be a big year. Sorry, Reed. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so, um, so I want to talk about upcoming initiatives, if, if you don't mind. So traditionally, you guys would go to a, like, you have a, someone sponsor a class. Mm-hmm. Is that the way it's still done today or is there an online way of achieving this? Jesse, that's such a good question. And I appreciate you asking it because there's lots of ways to access the CLFP credential itself. Um, Many people like myself take what's called an Academy for Lease and Finance Professionals or ALFP. So we love acronyms in finance. We can't have enough. Um, the, the ALFP is primarily what I do. And so that is where a company wants to sponsor or host a group of their own participants internally, plus others, or just their own cohort of participants to go through a class that is a launching pad for the exam. So you read the handbook and start studying along the way, and then you participate in this class, which finalizes and hones in that lens on the rest of our body of knowledge. Um, So companies today host them. We've had over 10 this year. Um, So we've had some online, some in person. I have two more left this year. And then next year, who knows who's going to call me up or email me up to assign more. But typically we do between 10 to 20 classes a year. Um, So those are the two-day options. We also have a self-paced course um, through the Odessa platform that is absolutely amazing. Um, I'm a runner and many people that run hear of a program called Couch to 5K, where you go from not running to eventually running a 5K. And so I like to call it Couch to CLFP, like you have nothing there (laughs) and then you dive in. Um, (laughs) It's six months of access, so you can break it down into bite-sized chunks and do modules alongside the handbook, which is another wonderful entry point for folks that can't dedicate two full days off of work or travel or whatever, or, you know, somebody that's got kids or a busy schedule, it's a great option to still have access to the material in the coursework. So if you have 200 people that are now graduating with this on an annual basis-ish, yeah. What percentage of those are online compared to in a virtual or in office? So the self pace is picking up traction. Um, last year we had, I think we had under 20 last year and this year we're over 20. It's still a newer product. Um, sure. As far as the two day course goes, it's about 50, 50. Um, some companies really like the in-person class as a unifier to get people to the office or people are all over the country They want to have everyone in person. So I've been to Minnesota, Iowa, Chattanooga, Tennessee. I've been to Arkansas. I've also been to California and Chicago. And it's amazing. Um, But there are large companies where the cost of flying their team to one place might be too great. Or, you know, the diversity of experience online might be more positive. So we have online classes that are great as well. And I like both, you know, I love to be home, but I also love to see the country and see different offices and meet up with people. So both are great. As long as it's not like Buffalo in like January, right? Yeah. Uh, It's like, it's, 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 (laughs) Can we can we can we not go to Minnesota from November to March? That'd be fantastic. (laughs) You know, sometimes I end up in March and I'm in Minnesota. And last year there was a blizzard 
when I was there, it was very snowy. I had to buy some mittens and a scarf because I was freezing. And this year it was 75 degrees on the same week. So you never know what you're going to get. Is that where you sit there and text Reed and be like, a little heads up, a little, that would be great. <laughs> Reed's like, what are you talking about? Thank you. I'm glad you're doing it, not me. <laughs> I love the travel, but it's sometimes I can't, I don't know what to wear. You know, what's the weather going to be like? I, I, I get it. Cause I've always done the exact opposite where it's like, I'm, <laughs> not in nice places when it's not nice in Arizona <laughs> then it's vice versa it's like why am I here well we just missed the <laughs> hurricane when we were in New Orleans for AACFB like it poured that whole week we were there it was crazy we, we did and um you know two weeks after that I was actually in Clearwater for oh um Delta Financial had their partner summit and I was sitting there I'm like I'm glad you guys had it the week before <laughs> like, <laughs> thanks for planning that <laughs> that was great um yeah, the weather is always fun and interesting <laughs> fun and interesting is right oh my goodness <laughs> and then from uh when those people are doing the online class do they have to take the test in person or is that online as well oh another super good question so our whole exam process is completely online um, while the pandemic was terrible, it forced a lot of digital um, technology updates for many companies and organizations, including ours. So the exam is completely proctored online. You can take it daytime in place of your choosing as long as it's within the stipulated rules. So you're not taking it at a bar somewhere, but you're taking it in a quiet office or nice I mean, space. You said, you said, you said bar. I mean, I, come on, it's equipment finance. So I mean, that's why I said it. Push it up a little bit. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Um, simple, simple mind. <laughs> yes, but um, you can take the test at a daytime and place that work for you. We've had people that are early birds. They get up at 5 a.m., rock and roll. I have night owls that take it at midnight. That's not me. I'm an afternoon person. You know, I like to work in the middle of the day. I'm very productive then, but it allows flexibility. It also allows people outside of the U.S. to participate. So we have sure. CLFPs outside of the country, and it's such a beautiful thing to allow another access point for people desiring this step up in their career. Perfect. And then... Um... Even though, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but if an organization's hosting, is it only their employees that are allowed or can other people from the industry come and join them? It depends on the company. Some companies very much like a private course where it's their own people. They're all working together for a common goal. And usually those are large groups of people together. Um, but some companies don't have a large population and they want to have a class for their participants, but they're willing and able to open up to others. And that can be either in person or online. And so it's a, it's a blend. I do, I feel like people lean more towards the public opportunity because you can diversify thought, you can have more bodies in the room and it's a networking thing too. It's such a privilege yeah. to see people. Um, and a lot of times I'll be in a classroom where there's, you know, different companies together and it's people that don't get to travel to conferences or they're not the, the salespeople on the front lines. They're kind of more behind the scenes. So you can see people working together. And so I, I love the public classes, you know, not, not anything sure. about the private ones, but the public ones, it's really a beautiful chance to see a lot of different people and positions in the room. No, 100%. I just, um, I know before that I've seen one where it's like beacon funding hosts, but like mm -hmm. you'll have ECS people there, Leventis, and then they'll even bring some other people on the outside. And I mm -hmm. bring a hundred percent. It's more collaborative and more relatable when it's like you're in a captive finance company, an organization, yeah. they don't understand how independence work. And it's just, yeah. You know, it's just more yeah. I mean, I came from a big bank and I only knew the regulations at the bank. And so it was very fun to see a broker's perspective because I didn't work with any brokers during my time and brokers are a huge part of our industry. So it's very fun to highlight different perspectives in these classes. And I know some, not to, not to give a plug for anyone, however, the Chris Walker educational fund for those people watching this and they're like, well, I can't afford to put myself to an ALFP in the program. Mm -hmm. so I'm not, submit a request to the Chris Walker fund and just tell them why you want to become a CLFP and mm -hmm. shot at getting a grant there. And to tag on to that, Jesse, I one 
phrase you'll hear me say as you get to know me is I really dislike um, when there's a barrier to entry to a goal or a cause or a place. And foundations like the Chris Walker Education Fund are fabulous. There are so many ways you can get scholarship opportunities to get more knowledge, to expand your career and skill set in this industry. And that's just one of many great ways that you can do that. So I really appreciate you bringing that up. I don't want people to feel like there's cost as a prohibitive um, element of the CLFP journey. No, thank you. And that's a always a good point. I just remember Chris and how passionate he was for, you know, the CLFP and everything else. So um, got to make sure we get that little, little, little plug out there. Um, so I'm going to pivot, if you don't mind. Sure. Reed, by the way, Reed, Reed loves that word. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I was thinking of the couch and friends. Pivot! <laughs> That's fantastic. Um, so you've been in the equipment finance industry before, and see, see, I didn't know that. So were you as a bank and West Coast or not oh, Minnesota? Yeah. West I'm, Coast? From, I'm from Portland, Oregon, born and raised. This is my house. Okay. This is my place. And um, all here, um, I worked in a suburb for a lot of the time um, that I was okay. there. Did you ever have to go to Marshall? I have been to Marshall, actually, um, okay. did the little road trip across the state, and then I've been in the cities as well in, in Minneapolis, St. Paul. It's like you just keep driving, and you're like, where is this? And there's this <laughs> big flag, and you're like, oh, there it is. There, there, <laughs> turn right. <laughs> yeah, turn right. It's like, oh, okay. Um, but anyhow, <laughs> but um, so going on, what, about 10 years Ish, in the industry? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so just what are your thoughts on the equipment finance industry, Mel? Okay, so my favorite thing about it is that nobody knows about it until you have a job here. And then you're like, how could I have worked anywhere else? And it's fabulous. Um, I know a lot of people joke like, oh yeah, I majored in equipment finance in college. No, you did it. Nobody knows about this. And it's, it, <laughs> no. I, no. I think it is, I mean, all jokes aside, I think it is such a fabulous, fascinating industry full of brilliant people supporting the economy, people's dreams happening. That's why I really like the business side is people have these dreams to have a business and equipment finance allows that possibility to happen. Um, I think that there is so much knowledge sharing, so many opportunities to travel to different parts of the country you might not see, um, you know, products and services and ideas that you otherwise wouldn't know about without equipment finance. That's why I'm here. And I really see the passion of people, you know, entrepreneurs, innovators, people that want to learn, people that want to support. It's such a cool place to be. And that's why I'm here. And I'm sure you have your own why, which I'd love to hear about, um, but it's a great space to be. No, I mean, you've, check so many boxes there are the reasons that I've been I've, I've been I've been almost lured out a couple times but it's oh. the Hotel California right where it's like why? check in why, why, why would I why would I want to leave why would I want I to leave <laughs> my lamp just turned off so gotta turn that back on I don't know if that's a moment where I need to have you edit it but here I am <laughs> Nah, you're perfectly fine. You can see your smile with or without a lamp, so we're good oh. to go. No. Um, and then recently, um, you were a next gen leader, um, so congratulations on that. I definitely see why, but um, wanted to kind of walk through what the, what was that like when Rita sent that email notifying you. I honestly was so emotional in a good way. I could not even believe that somebody saw me as a new employee of the foundation in a new role as a leader in this industry. And it was just such a positive stepping stone in my career. I just took it to heart and really embodied leader as an element of who I am. I, I love being in leadership. I love to encourage and coach and mentor and just share positivity. And so to be bestowed that honor was just unbelievable. And I think the coolest part of it was sending um, a copy of the magazine and the article that talked about me to my grandma and my dad. Um, my dad's in equipment finance too. He does um, construction and forklift equipment. So material handling is the primary element that he's in, but he's been in this for over 40 years. And so 
for me to be nominated and selected as a leader in the same industry that somebody like my dad is in was just so humbling and amazing and a moment that I'll always cherish. That's fantastic. That's another neat little nugget. I just, I nugget. <laughs> you know, you sit there and, you know, you frame it. And then anytime you guys are having a little disagreement, you just pull it out and say, where's, where, where, where's, where's your leadership? Award, dad? <laughs> you just gave me an idea for the next dinner with my dad. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> I'm here yeah. for it. <laughs> Sorry. Not, not that I'm petty or anything. I just kind of have some fun with people, right? I like it. I'm here for it. <laughs> um, Mel, so I ask everyone who comes on the program to give me a little, uh, a uh, fun fact about themselves. So, um, you know, what makes Mel Vincent tick outside of equipment of finance, finance. And CLFP? Well, I clearly hate plants. I mean, I've got the whole jungle behind me. I'm just kidding. Hey, you know I... what? And, 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 and they're all alive. That's they're phenomenal. All alive. That's phenomenal. I don't see one brown leaf in my pretty good, pretty good, uh, pretty HD good vision. <laughs> yeah. Um, I am a plant lady. Um, I love the green is my favorite color and I'm fascinated by all sorts of house plants, um, outdoor plants. So I have a, a large collection over 200. Um, but the fun fact that I really wanted to share is that I am a runner. I love running. Um, it was one of those things that I couldn't finish the mile in PE when I was a kid and I was always the last one and it was so embarrassing. And when I was in college, I was like, I need to do something. I have to run a mile before I die. Otherwise, like, I don't know. I don't know. And so <laughs> I mentioned it earlier, but um, I found couch to 5k. You walk a minute, run a minute, walk a minute, run a minute for 30 <clears throat> minutes. And eventually you're running three miles. And so I took that on as something that was a challenge for me physically, mentally, emotionally. And sure. now it's one of my favorite, favorite things about, about who I am and what I do. And in my spare time, I'm often running and or captaining relay races um, with a group of up to 12 people. So it's my huge passion. Um, I just finished my 10th year in the world's largest relay, which is called Hood to Coast. And it's from the tallest mountain in Oregon, which is Mount Hood, to the beach. Um, it is so Hi. much fun and I love it. Is there a lot of pressure on the handoff? Like, don't mess um, this up. <laughs> it's, I would say the hardest part about the handoffs is driving because you're in a car and you've got your team and you're trying to find the runner. And so you want to make sure that you time it just right. So when they hand off, you pick up the runner who just finished and you move to the next um, point. Uh, so that's that's kind of chaotic, but it's something I that I think. love. <laughs> and how, how many... Um kilometers is it between each runner is it a 5k that each person's doing you know um i'm, I'm more familiar with miles <laughs> than kilometers well, oh, yeah well, well I'm, I'm so, <laughs> sorry yeah, come, come, like come on bro this isn't europe um Are, you know, <laughs> miles I, you just i had 5k in my mind no one, it's right? totally so it's like, good <laughs> totally good <laughs> I'm like I'm like I'm trying to do the math no, no, yeah, in my head yeah. and it's not happening. Not, Mel, Mel, I'm not that intelligent. Okay, I couldn't do it. You could have said like seven. I would have been like times oh, wow. two plus plus half square root of fifty two. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so it's either a five k or three miles up to seven miles or a little bit over a ten k that you run three different times um, until oh. you reach. The coast which is 200 miles total race distance and we can figure that out in kilometers later if you would like so who draws straws for who has to run more <laughs> or is it like you know what i'll do three then skip then i'll do three and you just do six in a row <laughs> you kind of figure it out with your crew but a lot of people are like i'll run the long miles but i won't run those hills so if you want to you know figure that out Oregon's very hilly. There's a lot of mountains here. Um, so you gotta, you gotta make sure you know what you're getting into. All right. Well, no, and what's your, I guess, what's the time that you shoot for when you're doing a 5k? My 5k. Okay. So right now I'm a little bit slower than I would prefer. I'm about 30 minutes right now ish for a 5k, which is three miles. Um, my fastest 5k was 25 minutes. And that was when I was running like 10 miles a day back in college after I 
graduated from couch to 5k and led up to a half marathon but that's, I'm kind that's of cooking man that's cooking yeah I had to replace my shoes a lot <laughs> um yeah but yeah. For me now, I kind of enjoy a, a medium to slower pace of running and do okay. as many long distance events as possible. Um, it's so beautiful here in the Pacific Northwest and I like to just take it in and running is a peaceful place for me. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you for yeah. sharing. And then I guess what's the most exotic plant that you have or have grown? I have a plant called a string of hearts and it's a variegated string of hearts. And it's exactly like it sounds like it's a long, it's not in this office right now, but it's okay. in my okay. downstairs window. It's a long vine and the little leaves look like hearts and it's almost 30 feet long. It's just been growing and growing and growing and growing for years. And it's my favorite. So you're going to wake up one day and it's going to be like intruding into the bedroom. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> and how, is it now what makes it difficult like constant water or it needs do you have someone that comes with water like people have hot like dog sitters do you have like plant sitters when you're traveling um so i usually do water seven to ten days and i haven't had a trip longer than that so i'll water really well uh, right before the day before i leave and then upon my return i'll be able to kind of consolidate everything but it takes me about an hour to water 200 plus house plants and that's just inside because outside i've got the yard and yeah, keeps me oh going. My. So <laughs> on another subject, we we're talking about um, movement being a part of my life and those ELFA step contests. I know you were like way up there in the last contest and somebody was like, Mel, how do you get all those steps? I'm like, I have to water my plants. And they're like, okay, okay. I totally understand where those <laughs> steps come from. <laughs> fantastic i just like i guess i just move a lot <laughs> but you, you, walk, you walk outside with and you have like kiddos and you have a dog right yeah i have a 15 year old son um uh, my daughter's almost seven and then i don't know we have so many animals but i walk the dog every morning and that's like five thousand steps so between 5 30 and 6 a.m there's i cheat and get five thousand ahead when and i'm then still the rest asleep of the, day just, the rest of the day just kind of happens that's so. awesome. That is so yeah. good. Yeah. Oh, it's fantastic. And then what about the, um, oh, showing my ignorance here, the fly plant from Little Shop oh, of Horrors. Oh, the Venus one? fly yeah, trap? Yeah, 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 you have one um, of those? I don't have one at this house. I don't have any carnivorous plants. My favorite, you can kind of see it here. This is a Monstera and I got okay. it during COVID. I got it right, right when COVID started for my birthday one little tiny leaf and it is takes over half my living or my office right here so it Fantastic. just loves the light and i need to get some carnivorous plants that'd be kind of fun so, yeah just, just feed it things like <laughs> a a piece of chicken, bug you know? and chicken. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't know. I don't know but um you know i know we were talking a little bit about um i touched on the topic a little bit earlier about CLFP initiatives and what's on the docket. I don't know if I actually shut up and let you answer. Um, <laughs> what, what can we expect for um, different initiatives coming up now? We've already begun some, and that includes more inclusivity um, with our offering. So the biggest thing that happened this year, in my opinion, was we released an audiobook version of the handbook. Um, a lot of people have mentioned, you know, the handbook has a lot of information. It's hard for me to take it in reading. I'm like, here's it. Here it is right here. It's not I don't know what you're talking about. I've gotten to the first 40 pages <laughs> like eight times and then just put it down. So I, I, I can relate. <laughs> <laughs> well, Desi, the audiobook might just be it for you. Um, I I have had some people that are either visually impaired or dyslexic, or it's just hard to read a book. It's another access point, and it is a beautiful way to provide this opportunity to people that have felt held back in their pursuit of the designation. Um, we also have a brand new study guide and a sample study schedule. Um, for me, it was during COVID. So I picked up this book and I was like, I have nothing else to do. Like, why don't I just do a little bit every day and tell the class? But we're busy now and life can feel so overwhelming that without a plan to have a goal happen, you might not even do it. And so 
having a study guide, having resources available to support the journey for everybody is great. Um, we have already had one cohort of Australian CLFPs who customized the designation to their tax laws and accounting and regulations that are Australian, and they're working on their second cohort now, um, and Canada is next. So they're customizing a version for themselves. Um, I will be honest that Reed is more the pioneer and the international elements of the designation, but what I can say is that there is interest amongst the domestic United States and outside for education and knowledge in this industry. And that's where we're going to focus on next, especially with 40 years of the designation, you can only go upwards from there. Um, so I'm excited for what's to come. Got to make sure the next time there's an Australian cohort that you get tapped uh, on the shoulder like, to Hello. fly over there. Hello. <laughs> Hello, you, I want to uh, go to Australia. Good, good day, good day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not even going to slaughter that accent right now. So, <laughs> like, dude, that's British. Like, yeah, whatever, sorry. All good. <laughs> um, and then I guess my last question I have for you, Mel, is why should someone uh, want the CLFP designation? That's such a good question. And I will say, honestly, Jesse, the, the reason that people want to pursue it is different amongst every person. But what... Mel's words of wisdom, if we're asking, would say is there is no age too old or too young to pursue knowledge. And in this industry, the best tool we can provide ourselves is knowledge and information. And there are so many tools. This is a way to certify your knowledge. Um, a lot of people, you know, like I said, they see the handbook and they get nervous, or maybe there's a cost barrier to entry or time. What our goal is, is to provide a lot of different ways to support people in whatever stage they're in. And I think that at the end of the day, if you don't want to sit for the test, that's totally cool. Just get the book and look at our website. We've got all sorts of resources, even a glossary. If you're like, what does this jargon in this industry mean? I'm confused and lost. Take a jump and just look at it. And I think a lot of times we get stagnant in our lives and we don't have something new and exciting to go for. And for me, what I would encourage people to do that are watching or listening to this is to just try something different and try to soak in knowledge because you're going to serve yourself better, your team better, and your clientele. And then you open up the best network of people you could ever encounter. Um, I think those are some really core reasons why, but at the end of the day, it's an individual designation. You know, that's kind of the decision of each, you know, CLFP candidate. Um, a lot of people believe that by bettering themselves, they can better the world or the industry or the, the area that they're in. And I absolutely think that's true. So, you know, for one or many reasons, you can, you should just try it. Sure. And that's an investment that you're, you or your company most likely is making in you. And it stays with you. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. I'm a better person for this designation. And I just hope, you know, someone might be inspired to try as well. You know, I think that's sure. the, the, the best thing ever. And from an accreditation perspective, like, do you recertify every year? Walk me through that process. Because I've seen people on LinkedIn recently, they're like, just recertify. And I'm like, You're like Wait, what, what happened? <laughs> Okay. Yes. So recertification is a core element of being a CLFP. Um, one thing that's great about us is every year CLFPs will adhere to our code of conduct every fall and take some very small quizzes to get new information. So we did a little quiz on section 171. It's a big topic. We want to make sure we're all ready. And um, we have KYC, which is know your customer. Um, those are elements that we want to refresh people on or inform them on if they don't actively work in these areas. Um, we also update our handbook every year. So the newest information is available. Um, and recertification is a process that helps CLFPs get that new knowledge every year so that when we start in January, the new year, you're in good standing for another year together. Perfect. Yeah. Well, Mel, it's been a pleasure getting to know um, you more today, getting to learn more about the CLFP Foundation. Um, kudos to all your success in the last, I guess, three plus years. So we'll be hitting <laughs> CLFP 
2000. Wow, we'll just say at the end of 2025. We'll just put that pressure on you real quick. Oh my gosh, it's warm in here. <laughs> no, but uh, congratulations on all your success. Um, you and Reed do a great job there. I uh, like seeing you at all the conferences, and I'm sure our paths will be crossing at the end of um, this month down in Austin. I won't be in Austin, but maybe in Indianapolis. You want to be Okay, NIFA? okay, okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll see you at NIFA. Okay, I'll see you, see you there. Okay. And um, just thank you for this time. It, it's so nice to have intentional moments with people when conferences are busy or life is busy. And um, it's a real privilege to be able to speak with you this afternoon. Likewise, likewise, Mel. Thank you very much. And we'll awesome. be talking soon. Sounds thank you. great, Jesse. Take care. All right. All right. Bye. Bye.